So before I introduce uh, Sean, Sean Kidney, um, I'd just like to reflect on a, a couple points uh, from uh, yesterday uh, and today. Uh, you've uh, heard the number before, but the climate investment opportunity in emerging markets is about $23 trillion between now and 2030, including renewables, energy efficiency, transportation, green buildings. And based on an IFC estimate that we uh, undertook as part of an analysis last year, we believe that about 30% of loan portfolios of banks in emerging markets will be climate-related by 2030 in order to finance the necessary debt for those investments. And that is up from 7% on average today. So we will be moving from something that is a niche market to something that's going to change quite significantly what banks' portfolios will look like in just 10 years from now. And yesterday you heard already of a few banks that have embarked on that transition and who are actually quite far ahead, right? ProCredit that is already beyond 15%, going to 20%, and Ukragas Bank at 30% already, right? 10 years ahead of time. Um, and it is no coincidence that all three banks have been thinking about issuing green bonds, and two have actually already issued green bonds, and the third one is in the process of doing this, because in order to finance this amount of climate-related opportunities on your balance sheet, you do need access to long-term financing, because 80 or 85% of the investment opportunity it requires long-term funding. It's in green buildings, transportation, renewables, all infrastructure investments, all require long-term funding. And this is why in today's session that we had just before, when we talked about capital markets, right, green bonds came up, but capital markets is absolutely critical going forward to make that transition uh, happen. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Sean Kidney. You saw the official title. He's the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, He's only known to me as the rock star of green bond market development. So without much further ado, Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about the green opportunity, green bonds. I'm going to talk about getting energy behind this transition to a green revolution globally. I've got a few introductory slides to set a context. You kind of know we've got a problem. Let me just delve into that a little bit because I think we need to know the stakes. We haven't been going very, good, very well on reducing emissions. For the last 30 years, while we've been negotiating COP agreements, we've put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than in the previous 150 years. That's what you call a symptom of failure. As a result, the reductions we have to achieve globally are even steeper than they were when we were looking at this 20 years ago. In the International Panel of Climate Changes report last year, a 1.5 degree scenario, we got a very tough reduction like that. We have to reduce emissions globally to have a 50-50 chance of averting catastrophic climate change by 50% in 10 years, according to the International Panel of Climate Change. That is, I'm going to say, a pretty tough channel, tough challenge going forward. And our NDC targets at the moment are not actually leading to a reduction in emissions. If all the NDCs were implemented, we will flatline at best. So we've got a long way to go. That's the first thing to make. Now, what does this mean? Well, on current trajectories of the planet, where we've been going for the last 30 years, we will see a century of major disruption. I don't just mean hot weather, but the hot weather is a bit of a problem. In Germany, I think it's 40 degrees Celsius today. In India, in the last couple, few weeks, we've seen 50 degree days regularly. People are dying in this heat. 
Now, we're not talking about tens of thousands of people dying, but we're seeing the impact of heat. Of course, the other thing heat does, it changes our crops, it changes our water flows, it changes the whole substance of our land use. We will see this century 100% certain, even if we get 10%, 50% reductions in 10 years, we will see severe weather incidences become the norm because by putting in extra emissions for the last 30 years, we have put in so much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it's not possible now to stop reasonably extreme weather. So that's norm. The race now is to stop catastrophic, which is different. We do need to start thinking of resilience, by the way, because we are going to see the maize crop fail in Mexico at some point in the next 20 years, and the crops will move further north, rather south, in the same way the beetles are already moving north and eating the British Columbia forests. These things are underway as we speak. Heat will be a feature. It won't be continuous. It'll be patches. The reason why it's 40 degrees in Celsius now is because hot air is trapped over northern Europe, because the jet stream has slowed, because the Arctic has warmed so much, it's changing how the jet streams work. This is the complex weather system we have, climate system we have, and we'll experience it differently in different places. It may well snow in the middle of, of August in Northern Europe in the future because of the volatility we know we will get. We know we will get floods and droughts. Water will no longer be evenly distributed in places that are used to it, like the United Kingdom. The monsoon will become fiercer and then not happen in every five years or so in India. So India now has to start thinking about water infrastructure to cope with a total failure of the monsoon, not just being late like it was in Chennai this year, which led to people in the streets trying to find water and a shortage of supply. The infrastructure of all our economies has to change to be able to meet this difference. Of course, it will mean lots of people moving. One thing you can be sure in the next 30 years is that people on the land will keep hit, being hit by floods, and every time that happens, large chunks will move to the cities. We have about 53% urbanisation now. It'll be 80% by 2050. Think of the implications for your work in that. Think about where funding is going to go. Think about what the business opportunities are for banks in that too. We'll come back to business opportunities, but we're not over the bad news yet. We know that climate volatility leads to war. There's a direct correlation. President Obama talked about it in Syria. We've seen the impact in past centuries, in the 1600s. We actually had global cooling of two degrees. Why? Because in the 1500s, the Europeans went to Latin America, took smallpox and measles with them, and something like 90 to 95% of all Amero-Indians died in the space of 100 years. We had a massive depopulation of the Americas. In the tropical areas, we're still uncovering civilizations, cities that existed in the Amazon that were all grown over in 100 years. The amount of carbon drawdown from that forest regrowth was so huge that it cooled the atmosphere. Two degrees cooling. And as a result, we had a century of weather volatility in the 1600s. We saw summers without, without any kind of warmth in Europe, in China, in India, in different places. We saw droughts and then massive floods. We saw disease coming through. We saw the plague reappear in Europe and in China. We saw war everywhere. And this is a bit of a clue to how we're going to experience this century. We didn't experience it as a climate change. We experienced it as war and famine and all the other diseases that come with that. That's what we're looking at this century. And you can guess, well, we need to do some things about this. Yes, we need to beef up the World Health Organization. We need to make sure that people can dive into the Congo of an Ebola crew straight away and not wait a couple of weeks the disease flares up. Because when this starts happening pop, pop, pop all over the planet later this century, all our systems are going to be tested to the max. And we are likely to see imploded economies and wars like the 1600s when we lost a third of the world's population in a 100-year period. And it was pretty well everywhere. It was China, it was India, it was Europe as well. A third of the world's population with two degrees cooling. And we're about to see four to six degrees warming this century, 10 degrees over land on average, more so in America, less so in Singapore. These are extreme changes. The Earth has never seen anything like this 
while humans have been on it before. In fact, if you want to think about the implications, when I'm looking at a potential greenhouse gas concentration at the end of this century of 800 ppm, 100 years ago it was 250 ppm. Right now it's 413, 415. Imagine you've been in a room at an IFC planning day with 20 other people for three hours all afternoon. The windows are closed, the air conditioning hasn't been working, and you are getting very stuffy and tired. You want to go outside to get some fresh air. That room is about 800 ppm. Imagine the whole planet is like that room. We don't know whether humans can actually survive in that because the species has never been alive with ppm at that level before. There is an extinction threat for the human species out of this. And it's not just from pestilence or war, it's actually from changing the atmosphere. You might notice that if you've been in one of those rooms for three hours in a very long, tiresome meeting, you do not think straight. Well, it is true, higher concentrations of greenhouse gases lead your brain to go slower. We become stupider. That's not a very good prognosis for us, unfortunately, especially as we've got to think our way out of this problem. So we've got to get this done before the atmospheric levels go up high when we'll be too stupid to be able to know what to do. <laughs> That's what we're looking at going forward. Of course, the immediate impact will be refugees. We know there's 100 million people at risk in Bangladesh. We know that India's already built razor wire around the borders. We know that in Europe, we saw, whoopee, a million people a couple of years ago trying to cross or coming into Germany. If we see the kinds of catastrophic collapses of economies and agriculture in African nations in the next 20 years, we will see 100 million people coming over, not 1 million in Europe, putting aside how Europe copes of its own climate catastrophes. These will become the norm. One thing I can be sure of is that the UNHCR must be beefed up because although it is that stretch that's got the biggest number of refugees ever managed by a UN organisation on the planet now, it's going to be dwarfed by the next 30 years. These are things that we have to work on. And just remind you about disease, because there is no escaping for the rich. We talk in some places in America about going into our hidden areas to hide away from the marauding hordes. The truth is disease gets everywhere. We saw that in 2018 with the great flu that killed more people than were killed in World War I. That was nothing to what we're likely to see, and is nothing, by the way, to what we saw in the 1600s. The World Health Organization says we're already overdue for pandemics. We know that the IPCC's health committee says we can expect epidemic after epidemic after epidemic with extreme climate change. So there's nowhere to hide. Now, that's important to note. The stakes of what we're talking about are not minor. They are not about maybe growing a green economy. They are not about making Lagos a nicer city to visit. They are not about making investors in Japan happy. These are existential threats to our species. There is a reasonable probability that in 100 years, we will cease to exist. And it'll be the cockroaches turn. We'll see how they go. Now, I'm not saying it's a 100% chance. We're kind of risk people. We work in financial sector here. Is it a 5% risk? Is it a 55% risk? Don't know. Somewhere in between. I know I wouldn't get in a plane if I had a 5% risk of crashing. And that's what we're doing at the moment, let alone a car. So when you talk about this with your colleagues, you're not going to be able to bore them around climate change. They won't do it. But you need to bear in your own mind, this is exactly what we're trying to fix here with green finance. And if we don't fix it, there is no future for our kids. And that's the real crime. We'll probably be dead. They'll still be coping with the detritus of the mess we have made in the last 150 years. Of course, there is good news. We do have solutions, guys. It's not as if there's rocket science required to fix this. I mean, we have been banging our heads for the last 10 years in the scientific community saying, hello, a little bit of clean energy over here? Maybe a bit of low carbon transport, it's not complicated. We know we need to rapidly decrease fossil fuel usage on the planet, like rapidly. The International Panel of Climate Change last year and the International Energy Agency, the world's controller or organizer of petroleum reserves, said there can be no new fossil fuels if we are to meet the Paris Agreement challenge. That's pretty sharp. That wasn't the case three years ago. It was the appreciation of how much emissions had gone up in the last 30 years and how much we now have to get them down that came out 
that led them to come out this thing. So it means, unfortunately, every single new coal plant we build and every single unabated gas plant we build is now working directly contrary to the achievement of the Paris Agreement. We have to balance it with something else. This is a problem. We're building a lot of coal plants and we're building a lot of gas plants. Governments don't get this yet. The European Commission has just grasped this issue and realized they have a challenge in Europe. I was in Tokyo last week talking to the Japanese government and their jaws kind of dropped when we were having this conversation because they've been promoting supercritical coal and gas. Unfortunately, science has changed under our feet. It looked good for a while there. The last two years, we've had to revisit it. So that's the bad side. The good side is clean energy is coming down in cost. Solar in India is cheaper than coal now and in many other countries. Wind in other countries is cheaper than fossil fuels. So it's a rollout job on the energy side of it. We know we've got a deal of battery stuff, but we have very promising technologies in hydrogen storage, in electricity storage mechanisms of all sorts. We just have to do it. There's a capex hump we have to get over to achieve the low carbon economy. It is a big capex hump, I'm going to say, to achieve what we have to do in the next 30 years is going to cost us roughly $90 trillion globally. Now, that is all not, that's not all new. This is also redirecting flows. So if you're doing an investment in transport in Manila, okay, stop off the freeway, go for the railway line. That's it. So it's a redirecting of flows we've got to do. This is going to have implications for all lending institutions. We need to be thinking about how we can encourage, incentivize to lend in the right sort of things that will give us solutions for our kids. It's mass transit. A quarter of global energy emissions are in transport. Mass transit, particularly in cities. Remember, I said 80% of people in 2050 sitting in cities. We're not going to do that for Los Angeles style of cities unless we want to cover the planet in single, uh, single deck houses. We need to have dense cities. It's going to be cities like Hong Kong rather than Atlanta. Now, remember, Hong Kong, for some people, looks a bit tough. Hundred-story towers, small cages, and so on. But actually, Hong Kong has the same density as Barcelona, the same density as Paris. We have to make choices about the kinds of cities we live in. We can make choices, because in Hong Kong, you have something you do not have in Barcelona and Paris. You can walk out of the city into green space. If you walk up behind Central, you'll be in green space in 20 minutes. That is extraordinary. I love that about the place. We can make choices in our cities and make them very livable depending on the kind of city we live in. That's fine, but we need that density. Barcelona takes up one twentieth the space of Atlanta. Barcelona is the place we all have to live in in the future. Which means, yes, there is a role for electric vehicles, but it's not going to be all of us owning electric vehicles. It's going to be Ubers, fleet cars, connecting up with mass transit. There is a big job around urban development going forward. And it's about green buildings. Two-thirds of hard assets on the planet are property assets. That is, commercial buildings or residential buildings of manufacturing. That's if you exclude all the derivatives in the system. 40% of the emissions reduction we have to achieve between now and 2050 is going to come from the built environment. You put those two things together, you have a massive green finance market. Every bank already has a massive property portfolio. Now, think about this. All of those property portfolios to create a future for your kids and my kids have got to go green. How do we engineer that? How do we provide incentives? How do we get banks to provide discount mortgages for green loans, as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are doing here, as Barclays is doing in the UK now? How do we provide the tools for that kind of transition? How do we change building regulations so we no longer build the bad buildings? Now, what's a bad building? In a hot country, it is about insulation. It's about alternatives to air conditioning. The slight horror story of renewable energy over the last 10 years is that, for at least for the last three years, we have installed more air conditioning capacity on the world every year then we've installed renewable energy. That's one of the reasons fossil fuel generation keeps going up. We are not keeping ahead of ourselves with the right kind of urbanisation. We need to be thinking about what kind of buildings will be low energy consumption. How can we make buildings cool without just slapping an energy 
an air conditioned unit on the side of it. These are existential challenges for us. It's not just about reducing costs. But of course, it will reduce costs. If we get the right design in a place, you won't need to pay a huge energy bill for your air conditioning. So for individuals in Delhi or in Jakarta, there will be direct benefits, not just existential benefits as we're considering. Not everyone has to know about climate change. We have to change systems that will get us to the right outcome. But one thing you can be sure, in 2050, every building in the world needs to be low carbon, preferably zero carbon. And the question is only, how do we get there? There's a lot of science. We need to look at water investments. Water consumes some 7% of the world's electricity. So there's a mitigation agenda as well as an adaptation agenda. In California, by the way, 17% of the electricity goes to pumping water around the state. If we can find ways to that more efficiently, build at demand management facilities at source instead of just pumping in new water from 100 miles away, these sort of things, we can transform the electricity profile of the water system. We need to be thinking about adaptation. There should not be a water investment in the world constructed anymore that doesn't have a forward adaptation plan, that looks at what the rainfall, rainfall changes are going to be and how response to Because rainfall is going to disappear in some places. There's a credit risk involved, if you like, not being currently addressed in many areas. In India, one of the most exposed economies in the world, if not the most exposed large economy, we really need a lot of water infrastructure because, like I said earlier, we're pretty certain that the monsoon will fail one year in five by 2050. That is, fail entirely. That is, all those people who depend on the monsoon in northern India and in Pakistan will not get a replenishment of the rivers. we kind of got to get ready for that now. Storage facilities, changes in agriculture, I'm not quite sure what it is, but you know that's got to be done. Now, out of the back of that will become lending programs. In cities, we need to be looking at the conjunction of transport and urban development. Now, I say this because now we're beginning to delve into the opportunities. Emerging markets cannot pay for rail systems out of the taxpayer dollar. In fact, frankly, rich company, countries can't either. If you're doing a 100-year infrastructure, how do you pay for that out of the revenues? Well, there's a simple model. You can use property value capture. Remember I said two-thirds of all property on the planet, two-thirds of all assets on the planet are property. That is a huge amount of assets. Every emerging market is increasing property values. Every single one. We capture some of that and we pay for transport. So this is what they did in London at London Bridge. They revamped the whole station with private capital as effectively a tax on the shard for allowing a tower. We see this happening in Hong Kong, which is the best example of this. The entire metro system in Hong Kong is financed by a semi-public corporation off balance sheet, and it pays dividends back to the government. I mean, in Europe, we look at this dividends back from your railway system. Whoa, we can do this in Jakarta, you know. We can do this in Lagos because property values are increasing all over. You've got to capture it. On every railway station, there has to be a shopping centre, a commercial sector, and a few towers on top. And if you make it very green, the building, very energy efficient, give them an extra five towers. Now, that's easy, isn't it? If we worked with our city governments, with any building that met zero carbon got extra height as a way of repaying the cost, how easy is that? No actual cost to the taxpayer. There are many things we can do here which require private sector financing do not necessarily require capital from the taxpayer. In every sector we can look at this. And then we need to look at adaptation. We have lost the first half of the fight for climate change. We will see two degrees warming. We will see two metre sea level rise, and guaranteed. That means Jakarta has a real problem because it's very low lying on the edge, not to mention nearly every other major city in the world. We have to look at adaptation or shifting cities. Adaptation will probably be cheaper. In some places, we can't do it. Miami, the ground is so porous. You build a wall, the water just comes underneath. We will abandon large chunks of Miami by 2050. But that won't be the case in places like Shanghai where we can build infrastructure using those fantastic, I'm sorry, those fantastic Dutch engineers. And if you've seen the Dutch sovereign green bond that came out a couple of weeks ago, $6 billion issuance, $21 billion of orders, that's what it was for, this sort of stuff on the screen. Adaptation measures 
to uh, address rising sea levels and increasing storm surge. We'll see a lot of that. Now, I say this because we have a solution set. We know what we've got to do. We know we have to do some other things. We have to increase forest cover by 50% globally. 50%. We're trying to replicate what happened in the 1500s, except this time without exterminating a whole continent's population. We need forest cover in tropical countries to grow. We have to figure out how to do that. Well, we're going to see a lot of people moving out of the cities because of climate volatility. The chances are going to occur. So think about this in 30 years' time, 50% increased forest cover, different approaches to land use. We need to restock our marine fisheries so that we've got a place to get food. Well, what we have to do, we have to convert 15% of the ocean surface into marine reserves. It's pretty simple, actually. We actually know that where we've done this, fisheries bounce back. At the moment, they've been depleted. Every country needs to be looking at this, and if it's a poor country, they're needing to help from the rich. Okay, there's an agenda for you. Sound doable? <laughs> okay, I admit it's a pretty big agenda. What can I say? <laughs> but is there any choice? If you read the science, I can't see the choice. We have to be ambitious. There is no space for half measures. We've got one thing on our side. One thing that, you know, in a way is incredibly lucky. Here we are at a moment in history where we have a species-defying threat. We're not sure the human species can survive. We know that under extreme climate change, two-thirds, roughly, of all the other species will go with us. We'll leave a bit of a barren earth behind that will take a few thousand years to repopulate. That's what we're looking at. We know that we have the solutions. We know that it requires a lot of capital. And hallelujah, we have the capital. Hallelujah. We have $100 trillion just sitting in the pockets of institutional investors around the world. We have more capital on the planet now than ever before in human history, including per capita. Like, it's extraordinary what we've done to amass this capital. And what is the dirty secret of this capital? The unfortunate secret is that large slabs of this capital in places like Japan and in Europe and even in North America are sitting in low or zero interest rate investments. In Europe, 21% of institutional investment capital is sitting in zero or negative interest rate bonds. Ay, 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 how stupid can we be? Over here, on this side of the table, we have this vast pile of solutions to a species-defying threat. $90 trillion of investment to make in the next 30 years. And on this side of the pile, we have something like, well, in Europe anyway, $15 trillion, not to mention the Japanese and the North Americans, sitting around in zero interest rate instruments looking for yield. Guys, there's a bridge to be made here. I think there's a solution, wouldn't you say? I think we can make this work. No shortage of capital. And whenever anyone tells you, oh, we've got to be careful how we slice up the pie, just remember that. We are flooded with capital on the planet at the moment. We are swimming in capital, and it doesn't know where to go. I cannot find a European or Japanese investor who isn't saying, where can I put my money for yield? Why aren't they already putting it into Jakarta? I don't know. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Well, we know there are some problems. That's the area we'll work in. There are foreign exchange risks. There are local delivery risks. There are risks, but they are only risks. We can deal at the risk with some risk mitigation, and that's the role of development banks, to bridge that gap, to bridge the vast gap currently between the solutions and the money on that stage, and to start making the money flow. And once the money flows, we'll be able to step back and watch it flow like the Amazon. That's what we have to do. We know because we've done this before. This is not a new problem. In rich countries, we had to make money flow to infrastructure over the last 150 years. Washington, D.C. wasn't built by market forces, guys. It was built by government deciding what are priority bits of infrastructure and then ensuring that private capital would be able to invest, sometimes through government bonds, sometimes through guarantee instruments, sometimes through banning the alternative. There's a huge smorgasbord of tools that we can use to make sure that capital flows in the right way. But remember, we have that capital. There is no shortage on this planet. It's just in the wrong place. That's something that we can fix with time. 
Green bonds are just evidence that we have a market. If we give them green bonds, they buy. The latest one was the Chilean second bond this week, Chilean sovereign. Four times or 12 times oversubscribed, depending on who you talk to. Every single green bond that's large scale gets oversubscribed. We have demand on steroids. We have a lot of benefits for issuers. We are seeing investor diversification. We are seeing price in liquid currencies. If you go to an issuer in Europe, they're going to tell you they're getting a lower price for the green. They haven't got the data because no one issues an ordinary bond of the day of a green bond. Well, not necessarily no one. In Japan last week, Japan Railways issued a $400 million AAA bond, and they've got data showing they've got one basis point off it. Well, one basis point doesn't sound like a lot to me, but I'm going to tell you the treasurer of Japan Railways was cock-a-hoop, and he's batting now to do everything as a green bond as a result. That's AAA. At a double B bond, we are seeing 40 basis points. I think the Turkish Development Bank that issued their bond a few years ago with IFC got a very good price of a similar... We see the price bubbling up because the strength of invested demand. Now, it isn't sentiment. There's a hard heads rule here. In secondary markets, green bonds way outperform ordinary bonds. They are a premium product. Now, why would that be? Well, on one hand, it's crude. If you get a bond of a bonus feature that's green, like a free set of knives and forks, you tend to hang on to that and sell the ordinary ones first. So as a result, it's limited trading. Price goes up. It could be that people think that these green bonds are really good for the environment and risk mitigation. But whatever, they're hanging on to it. So it's a premium product. You see, in any downturn, whenever there's a correction in the market, when Donald Trump puts out a new tweet, or the Italians decide they might default, they're not sure yet, the bond market goes, whoop, like that. Green bonds hold their value. They hold their value. Just think about that. Anyone here in the bond market by any chance? Larry Fink famously said he didn't make money by giving yield to investors. He made money by making sure they didn't lose their money. That's the point of bonds, capital retention. No wonder they're gold. And no wonder there is downward pressure on primary in liquid currencies where you can find this. Not always liquid. In Chile, the two water utilities that have issued have got an eight basis point benefit, they say in print. Chile government will probably do a domestic sovereign soon, and we'll see if that flushes it out. You do see it coming up, but certainly in USD and EUR and Remimbi, we are seeing, seeing price benefit. But remember, this is not the end game. This is a symptom of success. This is an icebreaker instrument. This gets people engaged. It gets investors something to put in their portfolios. And after that, we start having conversations like I had with AXA Investment Management this morning on the phone call. So how are we going to be able to drive the green equity story? How do we engage more so people will do more on this? How can we push our issuers, our governments, to do more? That's the stage that happens after. They start off buying green bonds. Or in issuers, what happens in a government when they issue a green bond? Well, what happens is the Treasury starts phoning out the Ministry of Environment, not the other way around. The Treasury phones at the Ministry of Environment and say, have you got any green things we can put in our green bond? Because we had a really wacko deal last week. We need more. So most people, I think everyone who has issued a sovereign green bond, now has a committee of all the ministries chaired by the Ministry of Finance. I mean, how good is that? The UN Climate Change Conference, the COP, has been a Ministry of Environment conference for the last 25, 30 years. It needs to become a Ministry of Finance conference. At the COP in Chile, it'll be the Ministry of Finance of Chile who'll be convening other governments to talk about this issue. This is the beginning of change, folks. We are seeing engagement inside organisations. You get treasuries now knocking around the different teams and saying, have you got any green stuff we can emit? What can we do? Should we get a consultant to figure out the loan property portfolio? It's an icebreaker tool. It's not the end in its own right, but it's magnificently successful at engaging organisations in change. That's why it works. We expect 250 billion US issuance this year. We'll think the total outstanding green bonds will crack a trillion in quarter one or quarter two next year. That's not bad for a small niche market. Of course, we need to see a trillion dollars a year to make this work, and that's where you folks come in. But 
Let me just give you a couple of more thoughts, if I can make this go, about what we've got to do to make this market work. We do need to nurture it. It is, truth be hold, it is shoots in the ground, green shoots in the ground. We now need to give it some fertiliser, give it some air, give it some loving, tender care to make this work as an instrument that will really change the planet. That is very much your job. We need to do a lot more. We need to make sure the pipeline of projects from governments comes forward so our banks can finance them. We need to ensure that energy policy is in line so we can be financing it the right sort of energy. And we haven't got situations like in Indonesia where there's a preference given to coal over renewable energies because of vested interests. There are big issues we've got to deal with here. The IFC can't deal with those themselves. It has to work of other development banks and international institutions and these things. We need to make sure we're crowding in private capital. We can't fund $90 trillion from the public purse or from development banks. That requires a lot of private capital. But they are gun-shy. The Japanese investors are very edgy about investing in rupiah or investing in pesos. They're anxious about it. They're not used to it. Given 20 years, they'll be there, but we haven't got 20 years. We've got 10 years. So we're going to have to coax them out. How do we coax them out? We buy off bits of risk. We do blended capital funds, like the Amundi IFC Ego Fund. We do dozens of these things to try and create demand and provide a bridge for all that money that's sitting on this side of the stage so it goes over more easily. We asked them, what are you scared of? I'm scared of that little ghost in the dark. Okay, I'll sort out the ghost for you. Go on. Now will you move? That's our job. We become enablers of this revolution. We need to look at the enabling regulation, the sustainable banking network at IFC. That's its job, to get regulators over the line. We need to look at what are fiscally efficient incentives that will make a difference. Probably guarantees, not even money. But there's a smorgasbord from the last 150 years of financing infrastructure in the West that we can choose from. Remember, no rocket science here. No R&D. The toolkit is actually there. We need to get people to understand that it's about jobs, that it's about growth, and it's about livable cities. What's the solution to Delhi's unbelievably crap air quality that makes you sick if you live there? Well, it is about getting all those cars electric. It is about growing mass transit. It is about land use reform in the regions below so we capture all that bio-waste, they're burning it off, and put it into other uses like biochar or whatever. We know what the solutions are. We just have to install those solutions quickly. Now, Delhi is building mass transit. It's great. It's not using property value capture. So it's being paid for by the state at the moment, which is limiting the take-up. It's going to be hard to do as much as they need to do. How much they need to do? Well, Shanghai, uh, sorry, Beijing currently has 550 kilometres of subway lines. By 2022, it'll open up another 450 kilometres of subway lines. That is roughly 10 times what Delhi has. And Delhi is roughly the same population now as Beijing. You get the picture. Massive increase in investments in all these areas will create cleaner air. And there's something else. Most of what we have to do, most of the capex is job creation. It's stimulus. I mean, it's actually macroeconomic stimulus. I think, in fact, my economist friends would say, if you shove $90 trillion into the world economy especially in emerging markets, 70% to 75% of emerging markets, this is Keynesian stimulus on steroids. This will create jobs. Given 80% is going to be urban development, a lot of construction jobs, a lot of development jobs in that. We've got to push that line and make sure it's part of it. We need to be clear on what's included. So the European Union made a bit of a bold effort last week. I've been a member of the thing called the European Union Technical Expert Group in Sustainable Finance. We published our... 500-page report on what is green, which will become European Union regulation next year. It will de define what European investors are investing in. It'll make it simpler. It'll make it easier for people to figure out what to do. It opens up new areas, green investments, manufacturing sectors that hadn't been kitted before, included before. That's the point of that taxonomy. Have a look at it. Come and talk to me afterwards if you want to find some detail. The goal now is to figure out how we make all this sort of stuff simple. How we make it something that you can use in your work. Because as Pierre said earlier, 
30% of the portfolios of all our banks need to be green in the next 30 years. They're in very much in single digits at the moment, and that's the job. So far, so good? Now I'm going to ask you a favour. I need your help, because at this point I'm stumped about what to do next. I'd like you to talk to the people next to you for five minutes, max, and come up with some solutions for me. What can you do in your work? How can we take this forward? How do we actually grow this market? Green bonds, green finance. And then I'm going to ask a few people, volunteers, to stand up and throw some things back into the pot. Are you with me on this? Is that okay? Okay. And if if you're alone at a table, join another table. Five minutes. Three solutions each. You'll get 30 seconds to state your solutions. You can correct me on stage. Ten years. So, but I think just to come up with something to say. So, one point is that government is key. We all agree that government is key. Okay, so.
stop throwing me. Uh, I've thrown it a couple times and people are like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it, it hasn't really worked. Like, like con- conceptually, it's, I like the idea, but yeah. everybody's going to know what's going on. And, like, there's also, like, glass now. I feel like that's kind of our worst deal. Yeah, yeah. oh, this thing is good. Yeah, that's, that's good. You can clear a table. I'm going to have to run around with this. So somebody's going to have to... Thank you, everyone. Thank you for indulging me. Five minutes is over. It's such a short time to solve the world's problems, but such is life. This is not meant to be an end of conversation. This is just a little kickstarter on the road of an endless conversation. It needs to be the, com- the defining conversation of our work for the rest of our work lives if we're to create that future. But in the meantime, I'm after a few thoughts. Two, three max ideas. Can I get some volunteers to give us a 30 second grab? We have one here. Go, 30 seconds, quick. 30 seconds, quick. Uh, I'm one of the guests, Ivan from Procreate. Basically, what we would like to propose is um, changing in regulatory approach, basically, bringing high risk weighted assets for brown investment and decreasing risk weighted assets ponders for green investments. Perfect. Nice. Can we do it? Is that doable, though? Someone going to do it? Can I get a mic over to this table here quickly, please? Which one? Run! Run, Pia! They've only got 30 seconds. You're eating into it. Do I have some other people on this side? Put your hands up in the air. There's one at this table. Microphone here. Go ahead, sir, please. Uh, Madam. Yeah, so basically what we've... So the missing middle is maybe trees. And we don't have enough instruments for trees. And especially, for instance, in Pakistan, we have a 10 billion tree uh, drive. We've already planted 1 billion trees. But the government doesn't know how to monetize it. So the easy way is, for instance, you have the aviation industry, which is a huge polluter. You, If we can impose an avi- a green tax on it, and we have an offset with a tree plantation. So what, ha- what that helps is it helps monetize the tree plantation. And also similarly with the taxes that the governments impose, for high net worth individuals, there should be a green tax because they're the major, I mean, they use all the high luxury items and all, they use cars and you know they fly. And if they can have, again, a green tax, which they can offset with the tree cover, I mean, that could help. <laughs> Thank you, fantastic, uh, go. Mine is very simple, charity starts at home. From Monday, there'll be no uh, uh, paper. All the printers are thrown out of IFC. Uh, and uh, right through our, our, our organization, um, the, 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 the subsidies for metros trebles, the uh, rent for the underground uh, cars goes five times higher, etc. and then we just see where it takes from there. Achievable objectives? You sure about this? Well, let's see. Charity starts at home. Okay, okay, fair enough. Do we have any on this side Sean, of the room? On we need a mic over there in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, but speak. Over here. Yes, uh, try to make IFC's building a green building in terms of energy efficiency and, um, 
and uh, emissions. Nice, succinct, sharp. Over here. One over here, go. Yeah, we have we have two. Stand up. Wait, 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 wait. We have two that we thought were interesting. Oh, you can hear now, okay. Two that we thought were interesting. One was um, how much are we enforcing looking at risks, environmental risks in our own projects, not just in FIG, but in mass uh, agriculture in particular and infra, because we also have portfolios over there. And then the other one is, which dovetails into the building, are we evaluating the carbon footprint of activities like this? For instance, could we raise the temperature two degrees on the air conditioning? Mm -hmm. Hey, nice. <laughs> Now that is practical, right? That is practical. Please, go ahead. Um, so we were discussing what IFC could do with our own projects, and one of the things that we were discussing is we already have blended finance programs, and most of the times the roadblock we hit is whether there's really supply of uh, projects. Uh, even if we are giving cheaper funding, the fact is the banks are nervous about the quality of the projects that are available. So what we were discussing is whether we can tie up with the World Bank to come up with specific PPP par partnership programs that they are already working with in the government. For example, the Delhi example was a good one. If there's something that the World Bank is already participating in, what IFC does is basically ropes in the private capital funding for that specific project and brings in the blended finance there, then you have already a supply and demand fixed, and the bank feels more sure. Oh, that is so obvious. It's so fantastic. Pierre, you're going to do this, aren't you? Absolutely. Over here, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, we discussed... Uh, Speak up, please. ...the China uh, situation. So because China is the largest kind of country uh, contributed to the GHG emission, and uh, uh, I think housing or buildings is the largest kind of a contributor to GHG yep. uh, emission as well. So we discussed about uh, how to promote uh, green building uh, initiatives in China. I think we need to take a top-down approach to really uh, push the government, the central government, and also the central government level regulators to uh, really think about this. Uh, and this is something that uh, you and us, uh, we can work together to do. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. What? Oh, yeah. And then here, John. So, okay. Hi, Andrew McCartney. Uh, we had a, an idea around a green marketplace, um, a place where we have all the key stakes. We have the investors, we have the green projects and opportunities coming up onto one platform with also the banks involved and, and the risk mitigators. So we come together on a single platform where, where we can get the two sides you were describing earlier coming together. Can you make this happen? It's difficult, but... It, and things then hang on. Can you make this happen? We could do it. Yes. Fantastic. Please. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Florence from Abidjan, uh, we had one idea, which was to look at our so. portfolio. Sorry, can you hear me? That's oh, better. Okay. So, looking at our portfolio and uh, being able to establish a baseline of where the banks, right, we have mostly banks and financial institutions, where they are currently in terms of green finance, most of them do not know, so that we have a baseline and perhaps the same way that we track, have them track um, how they improve in, in the green financing as they go along with us. Beautiful. Thank you. Go. Uh, just in the government, uh, following up, uh, we should encourage with our World Bank colleagues to, for the governments to take out the subsidies for fuel because many countries, they subsidize fuel, which will encourage the private sector in increasing the demand for the green energy. Can you do it? Yes, with World Bank colleagues, yes. <laughs> That's hopeful. Good on you. Thank you. Over here. Okay, Carlos. Yes. I need to take advantage of this fundraising opportunity to ask for some resources for the IFC Green Banking Academy to take, <laughs> to take the knowledge to the banks to let them know that climate is a business opportunity, it's an opportunity to reduce risk, and it's an opportunity to be aligned with their stakeholders. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Please. A green retail savings account where basically we can help uh, small depositors actually mobilize a big group to be able to invest in a bond. And that way they, we're able to mobilize local currency to address the local currency issue because there's lots of retail deposits that can be mobilized. That's a good one. Yes, Bank launched one last year. They raised a billion in dollars in three months, billion dollars equivalent in three months, I understand. Ned Bank. West Bank, National Australia Bank have got these. Great idea. Please. There's, we've got someone here looking for a microphone. Who's got one? Talk. If you've got a microphone, go. Yeah, hi, this is Ivy. Uh, what we have a lot of is capital. What we don't have much of is knowledge. And while there's this Green Banking Academy that works with um, banks, 
in, in our table, we were talking about how the regulators also need this knowledge if we want to, if we want them to then uh, foster laws to to uh, bring uh, green greening of the economy. So perhaps I don't know if the Green Banking Academy also deals with the regulators, but this is something that maybe our colleagues at the World Bank can help with. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Please. And then also support the development of new asset classes, because uh, one thing is having the money, the problem is uh, not having the project. So uh, green buildings, uh, clean transport, they need to be developed uh, in the countries we operate and, and supported for also through the use of blended finance, and that's what we need to do. Great, go. So something we are doing in Chile, you mentioned Chile, is uh, beyond the green bonds, is supporting the first commercial paper. Uh, this is not green, it's social, but this can be applied to green. I think there are only a few experiences, not in, in EM, and we, this is something that we are doing now. So this is helping Chile, the stock exchange, to get the guidance and, and uh, guidelines for doing commercial papers, going the extra mile. Fantastic, a little word on resilience and, uh, and social. The SDGs need to be looked at as resilience activities. Every single one of them correlates with improved resilience in social and economic and ecosystem discussions. And so there's a need for us to bring in clarity around investments that meet the SDGs into the green universe. It's part of the same story. It is not a separate story. We'll see more about that in the next year with detail. Please, over here and then over and then the back. Oh, sorry. No apologies. Over here's first. Uh, from the Accra office. Um, Speak up, sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, reiterating the um, charity begins at home. We have a lot of flex work and telecommuting policies, um, but actually implementing them and en encouraging our clients to do the same. Beautiful, thank you. Very concrete and practical. Go ahead. Yes, hello. So I think what we need also is more data. So we have to push regulators to enforce all financial institutions to publish data about greenhouse gas emissions and to follow up on their performance. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, um, working with subnationals, for example, just to illustrate in Kenya, following the change of the constitution, we've got a devolution of power to county level. So we as IFC should be working with the subnational governments to promote the green agenda. Absolutely. Any last questions or comments or inputs before we move on to lunch? Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you for indulging me. You know what to do now. You have your action plan. <laughs> Next year, let's get a report back. Just to finish off, there was one society in the 1600s that did manage to not lose a third of its population, that did manage to avoid really severe famine and war. That was Japan. How did it do it? Well, it had some things going for it. At the beginning of the 1600s, the shogunate had just been established. The shogun basically killed off all his competitors. That helped. But in a, and maybe we have to do that, hey. But what also happened is the shogun had a view, a bit like the Mughals in northern India did, that they needed to maintain their society sustainably, and they started realising once wars were over, there were some problems. The first thing they realised is there had been massive deforestation in Japan in the 1500s. Sort of familiar to other countries, hey? like Pakistan. They decided that they would try and create a series of incentives and laws for small villages in the forest areas to regrow forest. If you didn't maintain your forest, that became a problem with the local authorities. But you were also given incentives to maintain forests. It was the first country in the world that consciously decided to regrow its forest, and Japan's forests now are a testament of the shogun in the 1600s. It wasn't like that in 1595. You had massive collapse of agriculture because you had soil despoilation, carbon being washed away in, in topsoils because the trees had been cut off the mountains and so on. All the things we see in developing economies or in Haiti. But they took a conscious decision to fix it and to develop the system. What's more, they had the same weather incidents as we did in Europe or in India or in China. They had famine, they had floods. But there, they opened the granaries every time it happened. They stored grain. And if a local governor didn't open the granaries, they were executed quickly. This was a very interesting government policy. The point was, 
redistribution of food and services to the poor and the vulnerable was a hallmark of the Shogun era. That is something we have to do globally this century because there'll be whole economies that will be hit, like Pakistan, and unless the rest of the world dives in and redistributes food, Pakistan will collapse into something we do not want it to collapse into. Or Bangladesh, or Indonesia, or northern China, where we expect to see extreme heat intensities and drying up of rainfall as well. So how we manage our planet as stewards becomes the question for the century. There are many other things. They also, by the way, rebuilt the infrastructure. Every time a bridge was washed away, the local governor was forced by the shogun to spend his own money to rebuild the bridges. The infrastructure stayed. Food was able to go through the country, unlike in some other countries when things collapse. We need to start thinking now of a different role for ourselves on the planet. For the last 150 years, actually for the last 6,000 years, we have been affecting the climate. When the Bronze Age came, we now know we saw a significant increase in CO2 in the atmosphere as relatively small populations chopped down whole forests to create furnaces to smelt bronze 4,000 to 6,000, 7,000 years ago. We started influencing the climate then. We've been doing it, as I said, in the 1600s, blindly, unconsciously. It's too late now to just do it unconsciously. The time has run out. We have to start being conscious. We are, for better or for worse, the stewards of the planet now. We need to manage it accordingly and manage the species accordingly. We need to change the level of ecosystem biodiversity, the level of ecosystem resilience through stewardship, not through benign neglect, which is what we've done in the past. This is a different role for us on the planet now. It's exactly like the shogun in 1600s in Japan, but it's got to be global, and we have to work together globally. International institutions now become paramount. The IFC is a critical international institution. It has a role in not only delivering capital and helping banks, but also in knitting us together as a species. That is what the next 50 years is about. Unless we operate together by the mid-2050s, we will collapse into balkanized, atomized states. We will collapse into places with fences around them and people trying to bang on the door. That is what's going on with the current populist politics that we're experiencing. There is no way to run a planet in a way that it needs to be run. It is no way to avert catastrophe because even if you're hiding behind the walls, diseases will eventually get to you. You won't be able to escape. There is no hidden... Uh, escape to Alaska out of all of this. So that's what we're against at the moment. We have clearly, palpably, a choice as a species. What is that one? It's the road to Mordor, if you've seen Lord of the Rings. It is a road to a world we do not want to have. <clears throat> it is a road where our children have no future that we understand and that we want them to have. It is as stark as that. We have a choice. We can create this future. But we have to create it. We have created the road to Mordor, pushed ourselves that road. We have to switch direction 180 degrees. And just remember what I said. We have the solutions. We know what we've got to do. It's over here. We have the money. It's just over here. It's just got to flow. That's what bankers do. In fact... We in this room are extraordinarily privileged because most people in the world, with this freight train bearing upon us, there's nothing they can do. They don't have to roll with the punches and try and survive. The 100 million people in Bangladesh, there's very little they can do. We are lucky. There is something we can do. We are constrained. It's hard. But at least we can do something. And that's what we have to do because there is no future otherwise. Thank you.